Yes. <laughs> so let's pick up where we left off. So we're talking about capillaries and capillary physiology. <laughs> so um, this is like really critical because there's this kind of governs a lot of what's going on with everything in the circulatory system is geared and organized for this, right? So this is kind of like why you have everything organized. Um, and it's basically where the tissues and the cardiovascular system meet. So it basically covers just about every tissue. So every system in your body has this in common, right? They need this. And that's the reason why this is so critical. This is probably like dead on the bullseye of AMP2. So just to kind of sum up, we talked about last time, we talked about a couple of things, right? So we talked a little bit about um, some of our pressure, we talked about filtration, reabsorption. And so basically blood is going to be coming through the arterial um, and this is going to be under the power of the left ventricle. So this is where your blood pressure is going to be pushing it through the arterial. Remember the arterial is the resistance vessel. So those are the ones kind of regulating blood pressure um, with that change in diameter, the vasoconstriction, vasodilation piece of it. And so as the blood comes into the capillary itself, where we talked a little bit about the net filtration pressure and the net filtration pressure is basically the difference between your net hydrostatic pressures and your net osmotic pressures, right? So those two, and we also talked about how there's two components to hydrostatic pressure. There's a capillary hydrostatic pressure and then there's a tissue or an IHP a hydrostatic pressure. And then there's also a blood or a capillary osmotic pressure. That's the BCOP versus a tissue osmotic pressure. That's the ICOP. And so the difference between those two nets is your filtration pressure. And we also talked about how if your filtration pressure is positive, that favors filtration. And if it's negative, that favors reabsorption. And that's kind of basically what this is showing you here visually. So basically, as you come into the arterial side of the capillary, your net filtration pressure is positive. Notice you've got a positive 10 right there. Doesn't seem like a lot, but that's good enough. Remember, you don't want this to be like flaming hot pressure in here because you're going to shred your capillaries. That's not a good idea. And so if you take a look at your two hydrostatic pressures, first of all, your capillary hydrostatic pressure is the outward push. It's pushing outward at about 35 millimeters of mercury. Remember, that's the blood pressure behind the blood that's going through the capillaries. And it's stronger in this particular case than the internal um, pressure coming in, which at this particular point is, they're, they're measuring BCOP. Um, and we'll take, we'll, we'll explain in a second why we don't really consider um, IHP, the, the tissue hydrostatic pressure here, all that much. Um, but BCOP is only coming in at about 25 millimeters of mercury. Remember, the BCOP is essentially the osmotic pressure of all those dissolved things in the blood itself. So proteins, blood cells, things like that. That's the sucking power that's pulling the tissues back, the fluid back in. So at this point, what that basically means is the the ventricular push is stronger right now than the osmotic suck, sucking it back in. And so you get basically a net positive net filtration pressure pushing outward because your capillary hydrostatic pressure, your CHP is, is greater than your BCOP. Now, at some point as you journey through the capillary, you hit that transition point where you start to lose that imbalance in those two pressures and they become equal to each other. So at the point where the NFP becomes zero, then you don't have any net fluid flow. So there's nothing going out, there's nothing going in. Okay, so it's basically kind of a stalemate, stalemate between um, CHP and BCOP. And then as you continue to move toward the venous side, then your NFP starts to tilt. The pendulum starts to swing the other direction. And that's the reason because your uh, BCOP begins to outweigh your CHP. And so your BCOP, which remains 25 millimeters of mercury, is now compared to 
a CHP that has been dwindled down from 35 to 25 now to 18 on the Venus side of things. So now you have a negative NHP or NFP, excuse me, um, of negative seven, which is enough to give you some reabsorption. So basically that's enough to suck that fluid back in. So what has ultimately happens is the water will basically be filtered out into the tissues along with other solutes and things of that nature. And then as the capillary moves into the venous side of things, the BCOP, that is the sucking power of the BCOP, will basically bring the water right back in. So the capillaries push the water out, sort of swish things around a little bit, and then it sucks it back in, okay? So ultimately, if everything goes well, you did really lose all that much fluid by, if you compared your fluid levels between your arterial versus your venous circulation, okay? Because all you're interested here is not necessarily losing fluids, but you're interested in exchange, right? Now, if your tissues are really, really dehydrated, will you lose fluid? Of course, right? Because you have to keep your, your tissues hydrated. Um, and so you will get a little bit of, a, of an imbalance in filtration versus reabsorption if you're dehydrated. The idea being, it's easier for us to lose the fluid at this particular point, make sure the tissues are nice and bathed in fluid, and we can always figure out how to compensate that in our circulatory system down the line, either through the ADH system, which we'll talk about again, um, or through just drinking water and replacing our fluids. Okay. So that's basically how the net filtration pressure governs the transport of fluid as it goes through the capillary itself. Now remember the BCOP, and this is oftentimes something that a lot of times students will lose sight of uh, when they're talking about the BCOP. Or the BCOP, the reason why it increases um, or it basically stays the same, or it seems to increase, right, is because not necessarily because it's getting more concentrated, but because relatively it appears to be more concentrated. Why? Because you're losing fluid. So if you're into cooking, if you're doing kind of a reduction, right, so you kind of reduce a particular sauce, the sauce isn't getting concentrated because you're adding more stuff to it. The, the, the sauce is thickening up because it's, you're boiling off the liquid and you're losing fluid, which makes the sauce thicker. That's basically what a reduction is. Same thing's happening here. So your perceptive, the, the, the functional concentration seems to be increasing, even though the actual discrete numbers of molecules, red blood cells, proteins, and things like that doesn't actually change. That makes sense? So it's all relative. Um, now, when we take a look at some capillary dynamics, um, certainly we want to take a look at hemorrhaging, what that is. Hemorrhaging is essentially, obviously, when you nick a blood vessel and you're bleeding out. The reason why that's dangerous is because what that does is it basically kicks the stool out from underneath CHP. So our CHP, which is, your, which is backed by your left ventricle, once you actually breach this closed pressurized system, you're depressurizing your system is what you're doing. So what that basically does is it craters the pressure of your CHP because that is based on your blood pressure. And then because you're decreasing your CHP, you're going to decrease your NFP as well. Now this favors then reabsorption. Remember, because as NFP goes down, becomes more negative, that's gonna favor reabsorption. And then that's gonna take in fluids from your tissues in an attempt ultimately to restore fluid pressure, right? So you wanna restore that. And that's called recall of fluids. And so that's one thing you'll do. Of course, that's only helpful assuming that you plug the hole, right? right? If you don't stop the hemorrhage first, then this basically has the effect of bleeding you out even faster. Okay, that's, and we'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. When dehydration, this basically will increase your BCOP due to decreased fluids. And this will also increase reabsorption as well. So basically, if you either increase your CHP or decrease your BCOP, BCOP basically what's gonna happen is um, um, 
so this is the flip side of it, right? So we're decreasing the other. So increasing your C CHP is increasing your blood pressure. BCOP is increasing or decreasing the osmotic suck, if you will. So this will have the opposite effect, right? So this will actually move things out of the blood so it'll favor filtration. And if that's the case, if it favors too much filtration, if filtration is too strong and out of balance with reabsorption, then what's gonna happen is you're gonna build fluids up in your tissues and that is swelling. That'll swell up your tissues and that's called edema. So generally speaking, if you have swelling, that's too much tissue uh, fluid. If you have um, dehydration, that's not enough tissue fluid. Oftentimes, if you go to the hospital, the emergency room, one of the things we do reflexively is hook you up to saline because most people are probably in varying states of dehydration, especially in a dry area like Denver. Um, and not only that, but even it, there's, nothing, there's nothing to be lost from that. There's only to be gained because either you're dehydrated, they'll rehydrate you with the fluid. And if you've got some sort of toxin or some issues associated with your tissue, the exchange issue, that, that'll also help flush some of that stuff out. Um, either way, it'll only benefit you or won't, or won't harm you. So let's take a look at um, perfusion, right? So this is, this is a term, we used this term in the last chapter, didn't we? We said uh, the perfusion pressure, which was the total pressure but the left ventricle needed to exert in order to overcome total resistance, right? That was your perfusion pressure. Uh, perfusion is a term that comes from the, the capillary side of the cardiovascular system. And basically what it means is the efficiency or the flow of blood through your tissues. So basically if you're perfusing all of your tissues and all of your tissues are bathed in blood and nutrients and oxygen. So basically you're carrying your oxygen and your nutrients to your tissues and your organs, which need them. And of course, you're gonna be picking up your CO2. Now, the perfusion, as we learned in the last chapter, is a function of cardiac output and, of course, peripheral resistance, right? Because peripheral resistance affects cardiac output. And, of course, your blood pressure, because blood pressure is affected by your peripheral resistance. So you can see how these three metrics are pretty much all tied together, right? So the greater resistance you have, the greater pressure you have, which means the greater output you need. So they're all linked together, uh, but these are all different things that will affect them. So let's take a look at some things that will um, regulate some blood flow issues. This is perfusion, right? So we wanna take a look at regulators local for the most part of blood flow to the tissues. So let's see how we control this. We know we got exchange going on here. We understand the nature of exchange. We know understand the nature of the exchange being driven by pressures. But now let's go ahead and take a look and see um, how we control this. So some of the things that control this blood flow on a local level is some of the things that you would want to control it. For instance, oxygen and CO2 are controllers, right? So if you have low oxygen, high CO2, that's gonna be a controller. Um, or in this case, accelerated blood flow. So you're looking at uh, dilation. So vasodilation, acceleration of blood flow. Um, low pH, which oftentimes comes with high CO2 levels. So that is also gonna be an accelerator of blood flow through vasodilation. Uh, nitric oxide, um, which is, an, it has all sorts of capacities to it. It's a neurotransmitter. Um, a type of neurotransmitter, um, but it will also have an accelerate acceleratory or vasodilator effect. As a matter of fact, some patients take nitric oxide for the purpose of um, vasodilation. It's not very common, but you do see it run into it. Uh, generally, you probably have to be working in a cardio cardiology office to run into that one because it's not very common at all. So obviously, high hydrogen ion concentration gets back to pH. Um, different chemicals that are being released in it during the inflammation that brings back our um, our uh, blood, right? When we're talking about things like histamine, which is a vasodilator, where we talked about the function of histamine and heparin as vasodilators at that particular point. So this is a local vasodilator, um, and then also temperature, elevations of temperature, right? This is this is the redness. This is the heat. 
that's associated with inflammation. So when you kind of get that redness, that soreness and that heat, that's a vasodilator. That's a local vasodilator, that's what you're doing there. And of course, in the case of the immune system, your goal is to basically dilate so that you can get your rest of your backup there uh, to do battle with the enemy. <coughs> of course, everything that you do has to be undone. So where you're gonna dilate and increase blood flow, you wanna be able to constrict and reduce blood flow. So, So some examples here, so some thromboxanes, we've kind of, we, we mentioned some of those, I think in chapter 19, we talked about blood clotting. Um, prostaglandins are in there as well. They have, uh, they're, the prostaglandins are an interesting molecule. They have, they're kind of like a utility molecule. They do a lot of different things. Uh, one of them is to act as a vasoconstrictor. Um, Precapillary sphincter constriction. Right, that'll basically reduce blood flow in the capillary bed itself, um, but this would affect a single capillary. So here you're talking about different types of constrictors that are associated with regulating blood flow going through the capillary. And remember, the reason why you wanna regulate blood flow going through the capillary is because remember your pressurized system, which means you've got a powerful push behind the left ventricle. The problem is before you enter the capillary, you need to step that pressure down because otherwise you're gonna blow up the capillaries. Remember, they're only like a very, very thin, thin vessel. They're only like one red blood cell in diameter. So if you don't have that pressure adjusted, you're gonna blow this thing up. And so you have to step that pressure down in order to be able to keep the blood flow low enough so you don't damage the capillary. But at the same time, you need to keep fast enough so that you can actually get meaningful exchange. So remember we talked about that balance for the ice cream truck. He has to go slow enough so the kids can chase him down, but fast enough so he's not just parked somewhere, right? So that's kind of a balance there. And that's the reason why you're regulating this blood flow so much is so that you can keep that functional flow to get good exchange. The more flow you have, technically, the more exchange you can get, but you don't want to have so much flow that you're going to damage or compromise the integrity of the capillary, okay? And that's kind of the trick. That's, that's the, the, the reason why you're doing all this. So those are auto regulators. Those are local, by the way. Those are just local regulators of blood flow. But what about more systemic, right? So these are more systemic regulators. So we have, remember, we already talked about our cardio acceleratory center and our cardio inhibitory center. That's already there. Right, so we already have that as regulators of um, cardiac output, and that's gonna be a piece of it. But we're gonna to add to that another center called the vasomotor center. And the vasomotor center is also another area in the brainstem that's designed to control vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So this is a reflexive thing that's being actually managed at the brainstem area. So in terms of vasoconstriction, typically speaking, this is gonna be controlled by adrenergic nerves adrenergic basically being mostly the adrenaline, so norepinephrine, for instance. And so these will stimulate the smooth muscle to contract, and when they contract, they'll close up those arterial walls. Notice the target is arterioles. Why? Because we said these guys were the resistance vessels, right? So then vasodilation is driven by the cholinergic nerves, like um, nitric oxide. So you're taking nitric oxide as a, as a dilator to basically keep the blood flow moving. And so this relaxes the smooth muscle to open that up, open up that diameter. Again, of the arterioles. So notice also from our previous discussion, when you're, when you're looking at dilation and constriction, you're not looking at these large global expansions of diameter, right? Because of that massive um, synergistic increase of, of, um, of resistance based on the diameter change. Small changes in diameter will change the amount of resistance. So you're not talking about dilation like this. You're talking about dilation like this and constriction like this. So just very little changes in, in diameter is, is able to get you what you want. Not only that, but because you're doing this globally across all arterioles, most of arterioles in your body, you don't have to like do a whole lot in one because the load is shared by all, 
right? So even small, small changes in all the arterioles adds up, sums up to large changes in blood pressure. Now this gets us to our sense of tone. We talked a little bit about tonality. I know in AMP1 with muscular tone. This is uh, what's called uh, physiological tone. In this particular case, it's basomotor tone. So all tone is, is basically constant action. That's all it is. It's kind of a baseline of constant action to keep you on the ready so that you can toggle to a different higher energy state without having to have such a cold start, right? That's what tonality does for you. So it's kind of like, you know, uh, it's kind of like if I wanted to jump, I'm sort of already crouched and ready to jump. So that's kind of my total state. If I'm there already, I'm ready to go. If I'm sort of sitting down, and relaxed or laying down, that's not a very good tonal state, is it? Because I got to do a whole lot of work just to get up on my feet before I even think about jumping. So tonality keeps you in a state of readiness, constant readiness, and there's physiological tonality. In this case, it's vasomotor tone, where you have constant activity of these tonal um, systems. So since we're talking about these cardiovascular centers, now we got cardioacceleratory, inhibitory, and now vasomotor center. Right. The question is, if you're dilating, you're dilating and you're increasing or decreasing your cardiac output in response to changes in blood pressure. But how do you know when to change your blood pressure? Well, there's a couple of things associated with blood pressure that you need to monitor in order to be able to know whether or not you need to change it. The first one, obviously, is the actual pressure itself. Right. That is to say the pressure of arterial blood. The other one is the composition of the blood, right? Because if you're not getting good exchange, then you're going to have an awful lot of compositional imbalance in your blood. You're gonna have a lot of CO2 in there, build up in your blood, and that's, that's, not, that's not good, right? The idea is for you to dump that, that CO2 off of the lungs and to pick up oxygen. So you have to keep this recycling. And so in order to collect this information, what you have, are a couple of sensors wrapped around what's called reflexes. So these are the sensory inputs for the cardiovascular nuclei in the brainstem. So what are the things you need to know? Well, I need to know about blood pressure. If the blood pressure drops, then you need to tell me because as the cardio acceleratory center, I need to know when that blood pressure goes down so I can step it up and increase the cardiac output so I can increase blood pressure, right? So what happens is the baroreceptors, which is basically a patch of tissues, typically are responding to changes in blood pressure. So they sense changes in blood pressure. And they're strategically placed throughout the body so that the uh, so that you have kind of like sentries, if you will, or sensor systems that always uh, basically kind of taking the temperature of where your blood pressure is and relaying that information back to your cardiovascular centers. So if you have any change in blood pressure, then your cardiovascular centers can adjust accordingly. You also have chemoreceptors. So these guys are sensing for blood pressure. These guys are sensing for oxygen changes, CO2 changes, and pH changes. Why? Because if you're not exchanging well or like not breathing, then what's going to happen? Your oxygen levels are going to go down. Your CO2 levels, the trash is going to accumulate. And because your CO2 is the major driver for acidity, your, your pH is going to go down. So your chemoreceptors are designed to sense all of these. And when they see an imbalance in these, they're going to relay these back to your cardiovascular So adjust accordingly either through the vasomotor center or through the acceleratory or inhibitory centers, or oftentimes both. So these guys are the intelligence. This is like the CAA spies that are out there sort of combing the body, picking up data and cycling it back to the, these centers, these cardiovascular centers. So the baroreflector the reflexes, reflexes um, are going to be found strategically placed in a couple of locations. The first one is in the carotid sinuses. So this is basically in the carotid arteries, which makes a lot of sense, right? Because what better place to measure blood flow and blood pressure than on its way to the brain? Because basically, remember the carotid, especially in us, 
we've got a carotid coming straight off that aortic arch. So this is a perfect place to measure and, and, and take a little bit of a temperature where that blood pressure is as it's going to the brain, because you want to make sure if this is, a, if this is too high, you don't want to damage your brain by having too high pressure coming to the brain itself or too low pressure, in that, if that's the case may be. So this is strategically placed to measure blood pressure on the way to the brain. Now there's another one in the aortic sinuses, basically on the way to the heart, or from the heart, excuse me. And so this is basically measuring the pressure that's gonna be going out to the body. So this is another great place to measure your blood pressure. So it's like, as it's going through the aorta, it's like, wait a minute, let me uh, measure your blood pressure. Make sure we have our total pressure right because we need to make sure we overcome our total resistance. And so how do you do that? Unless you have a way to measure what pressure is coming off of your left ventricle. That's, this, that's what this one is doing. And it's relaying this information back to your cardiovascular centers, right? So that's always the important connection to make. These guys are all relaying that information back to your cardiovascular centers. And then the really handy one, which is the right atrium, this is the one where it's measuring on the way to the heart. So this is your end pressure. So now that the blood has gone all the way through the systemic circuit, it's gone through some capillaries, it's been returned by the venous system, and right before it goes into the atrium, or as it goes into the atrium, we're gonna measure the pressure coming in. So you have basically three different pressure measures. The blood pressure of the blood going out of the left ventricle, the blood pressure of the blood as it comes into the atrium, so that's beginning pressure, end pressure, right? And then the pressure of the blood as it's moving up to the brain a special sensor to make sure that you protect the brain from abnormally high blood pressure. This is one of the reasons why if you have really, really high blood pressure, one of the symptoms is a headache. Is because you're kind of stressed the brain out with that high pressure. So ultimately then, if you um, take a look at rising blood pressure, what's gonna happen is that's going to relay that information. So the baroreceptors are gonna see that, they're gonna relay that information to the CV centers. It's going to decrease your cardiac output to bring down your blood pressure. Um, it'll also increase or stimulate turn on vasodilation. That also brings down blood pressure. When it falls or gets too low, so this is when your blood pressure falls, then it's going to increase your cardiac output. And it's going to, in this case, um, cause vasoconstriction, which will increase your blood pressure. So notice you have two different responses to the reflex, don't you? You have one set of responses to increase your blood pressure, one set to decrease your blood pressure. That's so that you can maintain your little back and forth, trough and peak, trough and peak, homeostatic cycle of blood pressure. So it's kind of what it looks like. So here's your normal blood brain. In this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna increase our blood pressure. As we do, the baroreceptors are going to sense that. They're going to be stimulated, and they're going to be relaying this to the cardiovascular center. It's going to tell the cardioinhibitory center to um, increase or to be stimulated. That basically will bring your cardiac output down. It'll tell the acceleratory to be inhibited. So this basically stops the accelerator. And then it will um, inhibit the vasomotor centers, which will cause vasodilation. So this is your combination of decreasing cardiac output and increasing or causing vasodilation. These all will have the effect of bringing the blood pressure down. So as your blood pressure goes up, all of these will automatically kick in. These baroreceptors are sensing it. It's like a thermostat. As soon as it reaches this particular point, it automatically trips the AC, which uh, no doubt everybody's AC is on right now, um, right? So it trips everybody's AC and it automatically brings it back down. Okay. As soon as it comes back down to temperature, it hits the bottom trough and then automatically stops right until it comes back up again. And so that way your house is kind of like in a, thermos, a thermal homeostatic norm. Same thing's true for the heart. Now, when we have falling blood pressure, it's going to inhibit the baroreceptor. So this is an inhibition signal, which is then going to stimulate your vasomotor centers. It's going to increase constriction, which will increase blood pressure. It'll also stimulate your acceleratory centers, which will increase your cardiac output, which will increase 
your blood pressure and it'll inhibit or stop the inhibitory centers. So notice what's happening is you're basically stimulating the guy you want to stimulate and you're inhibiting the guy you want to stop, right? Because there's two different things going on here. That's kind of like um, um, doing two things at once. You stimulate those that favor your response and you inhibit those that do not. Okay. So that's your homeostatic cycle. That's what's happening on either side of that peak and trough of, um, of blood pressure. So most homeostatic mechanism will stop there. We'd say like, oh, there's our peak and our trough reflexes. So we're done now, aren't we? No, we're not. There's actually a lot more that goes into that. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So the chemo um, receptor reflexes, these are similar in position, only we call them bodies. So there's a carotid body, again, at the carotids, measuring oxygen, CO2, and pH. And aortic bodies also at the entrance into the aorta, you have these aortic bodies measuring oxygen, CO2, and pH. And then these guys are feeding, these chemoreceptors, which are like peripheral chemoreceptors, are feeding into a central chemoreceptor who will then be, it can be in communication with the cardiovascular centers. and the respiratory centers. So this guy is gonna be doing a lot of different things. So it controls respiratory function. So this is where your respiratory nuclei, like your inhale um, signal, which is automatic, is gonna be controlled from this central chemoreceptor. It'll control and, and monitor cerebral spinal fluid. So somebody's got to keep an eye on cerebral spinal fluid. That's this one. This one monitors what's going on in your central nervous system. And then, of course, your blood flow to the brain. So your central chemoreceptor is the guardian, if you will, of your nervous system and your respiratory system. And so these um, chemoreceptors are feeding that information into this central chemoreceptor. And these guys are basically looking at pH. CO2 and oxygen. Okay, this is kind of what it looks like. So here's your chemoreceptor one. So in this particular case, you're gonna have elevated CO2 levels. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a couple of different things. First of all, um, you're going to stimulate your chemoreceptors, which will have a couple of different effects. So the first one is gonna have an effect on the respiratory centers. So you'll increase your respiratory rate, getting rid of the CO2, breathing it out basically, and that'll bring your levels back down to, to, to what to normal. On the cardiovascular center side of things, then it's going to be affecting your cardio acceleratory center. Why? Because you want to increase your cardiac output so that you can push out more CO2. That's why you're doing it. Okay, deliver more of that CO2 rich blood to the, to the lungs so that you can breathe it out. You're also going to inhibit your inhibitory center. So you turn that one off because that's not favorable. And then your vasomotor centers are going to be stimulated, which means you're going to vasoconstrict, which is going to be uh, causing an increase um, in cardiac output. Remember, that's that cardiodynamics flowchart that we all love. And that's going to increase your CO2 delivery. Okay. So you can see how you have lots of different things tied together here all in this one mechanism, which is one of the reasons why these images here are really good because it helps to tie together all these slides in ways that sort of help it to give it context because oftentimes there's multiple systems involved in any one particular response like this, for instance, a perfect example where you have a dovetailing of both the cardiovascular and the respiratory system in the maintenance of CO2, oxygen, and pH. So, what other things can uh, affect your cardiovascular centers? Well, of course, we can affect them, can't we? Um, so we can affect them with our emotional state. We can get ourselves all hot and bothered, right? So that's, that's one thing. Olympic system, that's going to be the limbic system control. Um, Humans have a well-developed limbic system. Most mammals do not. Um, but we can obviously have some control over this. 
uh, in terms of just us controlling it. Other types of controllers that we're gonna see is gonna be hormonal control. So like we have short-term versus long-term effect, effects of this particular regulation. Um, so ultimately, if you take a look at the excretion of your adrenalines, this is going to increase and stimulate your cardiac output. We already saw that one, right? Why? Because this is going to be a positive activator of peripheral vasoconstriction. And also from our cardiodynamics flowchart, we know that vasoconstriction will increase cardiac output, right? Which is one of the reasons why we go over that flowchart and those cardiodynamics metrics in such painstaking detail, because those cardiac cardiovascular, those cardiodynamic metrics that we run into that seem like they're not important, actually it's sort of like the center hub of how your cardiovascular system manipulates things in order to do the things it needs to do. So understanding cardiodynamic metrics is key to understanding how the cardiovascular system works and how it responds to different things. Let's get back to ADH because we're never that far away from ADH, right? So this is another one that also affects it. Um, so we already know a little bit about an ADH because we talked about that one in the endocrine system. We already know that uh, this is driving water loss of the kidneys. That's what it does for a living. And we also know that ADH will respond to a couple of things. Um, first of all, it will respond to low blood volume um, or the high concentration of solutes in the blood plasma. And it'll also be turned on by angiotensin II. You might remember us covering angiotensin II. We haven't even started covering angiotensin II. There's a lot more to say about that. But ultimately, these are all directly proportional to elevations in blood pressure, right? Because ultimately, what's going to happen is blood pressure is going to be mostly water. So as you elevate your blood pressure, you need to offload that water. That's where ADH comes into, and then it's responding to that low blood volume. So blood volume and blood pressure are synonymous because they're both taking a look at the quantity of water. Does that make sense? So let's take a look at angiotensin II. All right, this is the... The, one of the main members of the RAS system, just to, just to remind you of your RAS system, I'll put a couple of A's in there. So you have renin, right, which is secreted by the kidneys, which secretes aldosterone, which basically increases your osmotic lure, right? That's the alpha snap for luring the beagle with. And then you have a series of angiotensins, right? So you have angiotensin and gin. which converts to angiotensin one, which converts into angiotensin two, which then, I'm gonna stick another A in there, will turn on ADH. So a lot of A's in there, <laughs> right? So angiotensinogen turns into angiotensin one, which turns into angiotensin two, which then turns on ADH. So let's take a look at angiotensin two because this is basically the big one. This is all, also goes by the, you might know clinically um, by the name vasopressin. So that's angiotensin two. So what's gonna happen is angiotensin two is gonna uh, be turned on by this RAS mechanism when you get a fall in your blood pressure, but not just any blood pressure, your renal blood pressure. So now here we are, we just talked about the respiratory system dovetailing with the cardiovascular system. Now we got the urinary system dovetailing with the cardiovascular system. So once the blood pressure falls there, then what's gonna happen is the renin itself is gonna stimulate the production of aldosterone. Um, and then ultimately this will um, cascade and also result in the stimulation of ADH, which we know is water retention. Aldosterone is basically increase in, is sodium retention. So you create the osmotic lure and then water will chase it. That's basically how that works. It'll also stimulate thirst, right? Because if your blood pressure is dropping, um, ultimately, you're losing fluid, so you gotta reclaim those fluids. So any fluid that you have in your filtrate, you're telling it to come back in. That's what, that's the effect of aldosterone ADH. And then not only that, but you're 
drinking more fluids to replace the fluids you lost. And you're increasing your cardiac output, which increases your blood pressure and your vasoconstriction, which also increases your blood pressure. So all these together are working and pulling in one direction. These are all different ores, all pulling in one direction. That's increasing blood pressure. Also, erythropoietin, which we saw earlier, is also a positive um, stimulator of, red bl of blood pressure in the sense that basically it stimulates blood cell reproduction. So it creates greater pressure. Due to non-fluid volume increase. So this is what it looks like. Love these cycles, they just get like more and more detailed, right? So, um, so let's say we have a, a disturbance in your blood pressure. So you have a fall in your blood pressure where you have both short-term and long-term strategies. So in the short term, your sympathetic activation, that's an important one to, to remember, is going to be kicking on your adrenalines, your norepinephrine and your epinephrine, which is going to increase your cardiac output. And that cardiac output is going to increase your blood pressure, bringing you back up to where you need to go. Okay. That's a short-term circuit. However, what about long-term? Because you need to basically not just do a short term, but you need to maintain it homeostatically over the long term. In this case, this is where the RAS system comes in. So now what happens is you get a drop in your kidney pressures where it stimulates the kidneys to secrete renin. Renin will trigger that cascade, right? Angiotensinogen to angiotensin one to angiotensin two. So it'll produce angiotensin two activation. And angiotensin II actually has a direct in, has a direct effect on cardiac output and vasoconstriction itself. So, and then it also has these effects as well. So it'll actually stimulate antidiuretic hormone, that's ADH. It'll stimulate aldosterone, right? So there you're talking about your water with ADH, your sodium retention with aldosterone, and your thirst. So this also stimulates your thirst. All of these go up. So what water you have already in your body that you're getting ready to get rid of, like through your urinary system, like you just dumped a bunch of water into your urine, your filtrate, ADH and aldosterone basically has the effect of saying, no, 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 get that water back into your body because your blood pressure is dropping and you need to get that back up. So we need to increase it with this fluid pressure. And so the way you do that is by building up sodium. That's the lure, right? Where salt sucks. So you put your lure back into your body. That's what aldosterone does. And then the ADH allows water to chase after it. So the water chases after the sodium that you have inside your body. So the water ultimately goes into your body and you maintain it. And then of course you add to the water that you already have and you're already hanging on to by drinking more water, right? So that's your thirst mechanism. And then EPO will then increase the, the number of red blood cells. And that just gives you volume displacement increase is what that does. All these pull together to increase blood pressure and blood volume, which brings you back up to normal homeostasis. So now we have a couple of things going on here, don't we? So at, at your peak and your trough, you don't just have one mechanism going on in blood pressure. You have a lot of things going on, right? You got the neural stuff happening with your baroreceptors and your chemoreceptors oscillating back and forth between your cardio inhibitory and your cardio accelerator centers and your vasomotor centers. That's going on from peak to trough. And now you've got the RAS system that's also involved at the same time as those, basically going back and forth. So you can see then your blood pressure isn't a simple thing. It's easy to measure, but it is titanically complicated and there's a lot of threads that weaves into blood pressure. And that speaks to the importance of the cardiovascular system and the centrality of it to the entire body, right? So when you look at the cardiovascular system, it's very sort of uh, metastatic, if you will. Um, so it kind of like, or malignant, it kind of like has tentacles that sort of reach into every other system that are so important that every other system cannot do without it if they didn't have those tentacles there, okay, which is the reason why the cardiovascular system is the central hub of everything. So let's take a look. So these are basically designed to take you from the, peak, the trough. So RAS is down here at the, at the trough. So who's at the peak? 
the peak response is AMP, BMP. So those are the peak responders right there. So that's, that's what these guys are. So you produce a, a type of hormone called atrionatriotic peptide and brain natriotic peptide, AMP, BMP. So these are basically produced by cells in the right atrium um, and the ventricle. And so what these guys do is they basically are looking for diastolic stretching. And this is caused by blood pressure. So that amount of stretch that's in there, that's the stretch at relaxation. That's like preload, right? So your relaxation, which is basically going to sort of fill up. It's like a water balloon. So as you start to fill up, the amount of pressure that's inside you, it, you can feel it by basically feeling the amount of stretch, right? This is a common strategy you have throughout your body. They're called, uh, there's a special type of stretch, uh, receptor called stretch receptors for designed to sense mechanical distortion, right? So they can feel how much stretch is happening in an organ. Your stomach is this way. That's the reason why you can't eat food and blow your stomach up because there's stretch receptors on your stomach that sense maximum distension and you'll, you'll barf. Basically, it'll trigger a vomit reflex before you can blow it up. Similar thing is happening here. You've got stretch sensors that are communicating to these cells. Um, we're a little on the stretchy side. The blood pressure here is a bit on the hot side. So we need to back this down. And so what they basically will do is they'll antagonize aldosterone. And what does that mean? That means they dump sodium and water. Instead of reclaiming it, they dump it. So what they do is they stimulate the dumping of sodium into the filtrate, and then that causes water to exit the body into the filtrate and urinate, urinate that out. And that brings your blood volume and your blood pressure back down so that it's not so high. So this reduces that amount of fluid pressure stress that's on the heart itself. So this is kind of what it looks like. So as you have rising blood volume, your natriuretic peptides are gonna be released by the heart. It's going to increase sodium loss which means water's gonna chase it, or salt sucks. And as you do that, that's gonna reduce your blood volume. Um, it's also gonna reduce your thirst. You're not gonna be super thirsty at this particular point. It's gonna shut down ADH, aldosterone, epinephrine, norepinephrine. These are all the things that stimulated water retention. So it's gonna shut down all these things that were stimulating water retention. And then it's also going to um, increase vasodilation so that you can increase your blood volume and basically get that blood into the urine stream the blood not the blood but the fluid right so you're you're looking to increase blood flow in the urine so that you can offload more plasma more fluid and that'll bring your blood volume back down to normal okay so these guys will all work together as a physiological group And their whole goal is to basically maintain that homeostasis, right? Which looks kind of simple, but not really. Okay. So we talked a little bit about hemorrhaging before. We just want to talk a little bit about what the cardiovascular response to hemorrhaging is. Um, what happens when you start to, to hemorrhage? So when you start to hemorrhage, or what's happened is you've depressurized the system. <clears throat> so when you've depressurized the system um, your goal is two things maintain blood pressure keep it going or people starve and cells die bad things happen if the people aren't feeding or, and eating right so you keep those supply lines moving at all costs and the other one is restore your blood volume and your pressure of course there's there's something that's a problem here this requires one preliminary step. Plug the hole. 
Because if you don't, all you're going to do is just basically bleed out. And that's exactly how you bleed out. Okay. Let's take a look at some short term um, elevations, some things that happen. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this as we sort of get a load of this. But what we're going to do is we talk, take a look at some of these sort of elevated blood pressure pieces because what's going to happen is some of these are going to be sort of leveraged in order to deal with the hemorrhaging thing, right? So I want you to hang on to this one. We're going to talk a little bit first about how to maintain um, elevation or to create elevation of blood pressure, which is what you're going to be trying to do when you're hemorrhaging because you, you drop your blood pressure and you're trying to elevate it now, keep it going. That's what you have to do. These are some of the things that you would be doing in order to be able to to answer one and one and two. So the first thing obviously is you got your carotid and your aortic reflexes that are kicking off typically. So these guys are gonna be increasing your cardiac output, which is gonna increase your blood pressure. It's also gonna be causing vasoconstriction, which is gonna increase your blood pressure. So that's one way to increase or elevate your blood pressure. Um, and so the sympathetic nervous system is obviously gonna kick in. Think about it, if, you just, if you're hemorrhaging, something traumatic has happened to you. You're likely in fight or flight mode. So you're probably already in the sympathetic nervous system. This is going to be kicking in your hypothalamus. This is gonna also further constrict your arterioles, right? Which is going to increase your blood pressure and vasoconstriction increases your venous blood return, which facilitates blood flow and blood moving back to the heart. So these are all short-term strategies to elevate your blood pressure. Now, hormonal effects, those are just kind of like the neural effects. So the hormonal effects that we have here, um, so these are typically, obviously you wanna increase your cardiac output. So you're increasing your blood pressure, but obviously the main culprits that we know about. So obviously the adrenalines, those will increase your heart rate and that'll increase your cardiac output, right? Which increases cardiac output. Of course, ADH and angiotensin too, right? Because these are retaining water. That'll increase your blood pressure as well, right? Technically speaking, in a case of uh, something like, uh, like a, a hemorrhage where you're bleeding or something like that, then you probably have plenty of adrenaline going into your body. So you're already increasing your blood pressure that way. And of course, you're probably kicking up your ADH and angiotensin two to sort of reinforce that. But remember, ADH and angiotensin two are designed mostly to be long-term maintenance strategies. Remember, we saw that in the previous slide. Those are more of the long-term strategy, but you can sort of upregulate them in a pinch to give them short-term backup with the adrenaline. So what happens then as you're sitting there bleeding all over the place? Okay, that's me a little, a little dramatic. But if you lose about, and this is just an average, about 20% of your total blood volume, then you'll drop into shock, what we call shock. That's basically a physiological response that your body has due to the um, overwhelming loss of blood and, um, and the, um, the fact that it doesn't have the nutrients and the oxygen that it needs. So your body starts to respond, starts to go into shock. Um, for the most part. Um, and so once you drop into that, then your body is focused on um, what, it's, what it's trying to do is it's trying to restore normal. But when you get into shock, it means it's like, okay, wait a minute, this is bad. We're not restoring normal. Um, and so it's not able to actually restore that blood pressure. And so you can think about it, this typically happens because the body is trying to restore pressure. But the hole is not plugged. So all these increases in blood pressure that automatically start kicking in because your system is depressurizing, all that really does if the hole is not plugged, like if you nick your femoral and it's not plugged, all that's going to do is increase your blood pressure and it's just going to force the blood out of your body even faster. 
which is the reason why when you do something like nicking your femoral or your carotid, it is a fast, it's a fast progression. Generally speaking, if you nick those two, you are not sitting there for hours and hours and hours waiting to bleed to death. It's minutes at best. Because what's happening is as you're bleeding out, your body is trying to restore blood pressure, but as it's restoring blood pressure, it's actually pushing the blood out of the injury even faster. And the faster it comes out, the faster your body tries to push it because it's trying to restore order. And unless you plug that hole, it's just basically like a death spiral. It's like you're circling the drain. And that's the reason why those bleed outs happen very quickly and why they're so drastic. That's the reason why the response to them is so drastic, right? I mean, if you nick your femoral, what's the first thing you do? You don't have to be a trained anybody to, to know this one. What's the first thing you do? Yeah, you put pressure on it, you rip your shirt off, you try to dry it in shreds and try to start making a curry. I don't care if you're buck naked out in the middle of the street, right? I mean, as you put pressure on it to keep it while somebody's trying to tie off a tourniquet. And when you're tying that off, is it just like, a, yeah, that's a little too tight? No, it's like, listen, you're going to lose your leg here. But guess what? You're not going to lose your life, right? Because that's literally you're minutes away from that person dying. Now, that's good for the leg if you nick your carotid you're you're just you're screwed that's just that's that's the only way I can, there's no way to stop that one uh you're just screwed um which is one of the reasons why a lot of our reflexes our self-defense reflexes are all head and neck related like if, if i went at like that just like shot you know just kind of startled her reflexively she would right, put up her arms covering her head and her neck because those are the most vulnerable areas, especially the neck, right? So then assuming you get um, the whole plug, then you start dropping into more of a long-term restoration, right? So you're kind of in crisis mode, stop the crisis first, that's tourniquet. Now we can start looking at sort of restoring order and that's where you get that recall of fluids. Remember we said that when you crater the chp that's what's happening when you're bleeding all over the place then what's going to happen is you're going to favor reabsorption that's going to pull all those fluids from the tissues to try to help restore that um, aldosterone and ada will be probably very active for a very long time trying to bring in that water so you're not really going to be urinating hardly at all because you're going to be keeping every scrap of water you can get a hold of and you're going to be hanging on to it you're going to be thirsty as heck, right? You're going to have to replace a lot of fluids. Or if you're in the emergency room, they're just going to load you up with fluids. They're going to flood you with fluids to try to keep you from, uh, to try to get those fluids back in there and get that blood pressure back in there. And then of course, um, you're going to have a massive upregulation and erythropoiesis, right? So that's your red blood cell, white blood cell production. But these are all long-term, aren't they? They take time. And so that's one of the reasons why you kind of have, uh, you have a very narrow window to try to get the bleeding stopped. Because if you, if you're, if you have to be alive long enough for these to actually be able to replace them. And if you're not, then obviously you're not gonna make it, right? That's where blood transfusions and things like that come into play. It's basically not designed to give you a permanent cover. It's just like a little stop gap. It's like, listen, you know what? We got to give you some blood because you lost a ton of blood. We got to give you at least enough to keep your body alive while your body is restoring itself to give your body some coverage so that it can actually rebuild that blood and that pressure. So that's kind of what it looks like. So basically you have um, your hemorrhage going on. And then you're gonna have your endocrine responses. So these are gonna be both short and long-term going in here. And so um, you have some endocrine responses that are typically associated with ADH, ang angiotensin II, aldosterone. So that's the RAS system. That's gonna be increasing your blood volume. But then you also have the nervous system stuff, right? So a lot of this is gonna be stimulation of the baroreceptors, chemoreceptors. You're gonna be increasing your cardiovascular centers, your sympathetic centers. Uh, your respiratory centers. This is also going to be stimulated by the limbic system, 
right? That's pain and stress and anxiety and fear which is one of the reasons why they say the best thing you can do if you do damage yourself and you got excessive bleeding is calm yourself down, right? Just calm yourself down. This is also one of the reasons why paramedics oftentimes will talk to patients about anything, honestly, just as long as they can get the patient's mind off of their injury. Because if they realize how bad it is that their guts are hanging out all over the street, they're going to freak out and it's going to start creating this death spiral. So the idea is like, we need you to stop this one here. We don't need you to increase your cardiac output with anxiety and fear and things like that with the limbic system. So just, you just focus on me, just listen to my voice, right? Just listen to me. And sometimes that has a very calming effect on patients because it gives them something to sort of mentally reach out to and hang on to uh, mentally and to kind of ignore this, right? It's kind of almost like an out of body kind of a thing. Um, and that's a common technique that you see in emergency medicine, in battlefield medicine. <clears throat> so these will all basically increase our cardiac output and then increase the blood pressure. So this is kind of what the body needs to do, but the body needs to do this only if that hole is plugged, <laughs> right? So if you don't plug that hole, then it's not going to go well. That's the end of 21. Yay, yay. But you can imagine the reason why it's, it's a really important uh, chapter. So we're gonna dig into respiratory. No rest for the weary. There's too much to do to be resting. And probably starting next week, I'll be doing my abbreviated versions, sketches, I'll call them, right, of the systems themselves, but meaningful sketches. And um, one of the things that I want to do is I want to start that process now um, because there's a lot of anatomy that kind of is, um, is helpful. We kind of covered a little bit of that anatomy already in lab. So we kind of have our histology and our basic pieces. So I want to move quickly through the anatomy and I want to try to move more toward the physiology piece of it uh, because that's going to be the most important part. So the, the seminal anatomy is is obviously the alveolus. So this is basically what the alveoli looks like. So you can see you've got basically your bronchioles covered by smooth muscle that allows your bronchioles to contract and to expand. Um, these are the culprits behind asthmatic attacks. Uh, basically they constrict too much um, abnormally and you can use different stimulators, inhalers and things like that. Just that steroids, for instance, basically just kind of open them up, stimulates those muscles to open them up so you can clear out that passageway. But you can see that each one of these little circles is an alveolus. That's a little air sac. Um, and I like to show this image because, uh, first of all, you got this sort of cluster. So here's like your big um, alveolar um, sac. And then the individual alveoli are each of these little individual chambers in there to fill with air. But I like to show this because I, I like to show it to you to show you that, that basically here you have a very vascular network. Right, so this is just this is just bathed, covered. Um, these alveolar sacs are just covered in in capillaries, in capillary vessels. That's what these guys are. So it's a very very vascular area, which makes a lot of sense, right? Because it's one of the primary points of exchange for your oxygen and, and CO two between blood and air. And on a histological level, you can see here. This looks familiar to you guys, right? So where the type one cells are the wall cells, the type two cells, and the surfactant cells, which basically means they cover the inside of that chamber. So your type ones are gonna be the wall. And then of course your type two cells are gonna be producing surfactant. 
And then also in there are what's called um, alveolar macrophages or dust cells. So these are kind of like providing like a little bit of a, a patrol, an immune system outlet basically to sort of attack bad guys that you might breathe in, and those sorts of things. So we talked a little bit about surfactant already in lab. Remember surfactant is that kind of lipidy secretion that these surfactant cells will secrete so that your alveolar sacs do not collapse on themselves and stick. So if you stick, that's called um, um, respiratory distress. And so the idea is to get them to sort of close and then open up and close and open up. Okay, so that's the idea there. And then this might look familiar to you guys from lab. We saw an image of this. Uh, Marriott and Martini actually work for the same publisher, so they oftentimes use the same stock footage. So this is, I think, the exact same image we have in the lab manual uh, that we gave you. So here you can see the type one cells. These are the um, wall cells. And then the type two cells, the surfactant cells, which are these um, surfactant secreting cells. And so they have a little bit of surfactant on the inner layer, like a little, um, a little bit of fluid on the inner layer. And then patrolling around are these macrophages, just making sure there's no bad guys in there that you breathe in or anything like that. Okay. So those are macrophages. that's all basically review from the lab. But the one thing I want to get to is this guy right here, the respiratory membrane, right? Because we want to talk a little bit about the physics of the respiratory system and the exchange of the gases there. And it all starts with the respiratory membrane, which is the membrane. It's a thin little membrane that will allow oxygen and CO2 to exchange across them. Now remember, oxygen and CO2 They exchange by diffusion, which means that they have to be small distances, right? They can't be large distances. This diffusion doesn't work across large distances, so they have to be small distances. So to have maximum exchange, the distance across which oxygen and CO2 have to pass has to be the smallest you can possibly get. Well, what is the smallest distance you can possibly get? Well, think about it. The smallest you can possibly get in terms of a liner is a simple squamous endothelial liner, yes, with a basement membrane. That's as thin as you can get, right? Well, let's take a look at the respiratory membrane. The respiratory membrane has three layers. The squamous epithelial cells, got it, right? We just predicted that one. The endothelial cells of the capillary, because the capillary is in this, involved in this as well, right? And then the basement membranes. Only in this case, there's two of them, so they're fused together. So what does that look like? So what that looks like is, let's say here is the capillary. Here's the endothelium of the capillary. And then here's the basement membrane of the capillary. And now here's the basement membrane fused together of the alveolus. And then the simple squamous epithelium of the alveolus. Is that about as thin as you can get? So here's your capillary up here. And here's your alveolus down here. That's about as thin as you can get. Single layer, basement membrane on both sides. That's it. That's as thin as you can get. So this is what it looks like. Here's our respiratory membrane. So we're talking about 0.5 micrometers. That's 10 to the minus six meters. So that's, that's a millionth of a meter. And it's actually half that um, size, right? So basically then you have your capillary endothelium here. 
and then you have your alveolar endothelium here. And then in between this area here, the gray area, is going to be your fused basement membrane. And then on the alveolar side of things, you're going to have your little layer of surfactant, that little blue layer right there. That's your surfactant layer. So what an oxygen molecule or a CO2 molecule has to do is it has to pass through each of these layers into the alveolar airspace so that it can exit, so you can breathe it out. Same thing for the oxygen. The oxygen has to go through this layer into the capillary so that you can breathe it in. Right? So that's basically what's happening there. So the respiratory membrane is critical because ultimately what happens is um, I was going to say. I got myself distracted because I'm going to add a slide here. I know it's terrible. No, not the okay, undo. Delete. Okay. So here's what I want to do. Because we're talking about Fick's law, there's actually a series of laws that governs the physiology of the respiratory system. And we want to, what I want to do is I want to put them all in one place. And, and it's usually good to kind of go into fixed law like right after those. So I like to do them all at once um, and their gas laws. So the first law is Boyle's law. Let me know what Boyle's law is. So this is basically a law that governs or that determines the pressure of a gas relative to its volume, okay? So this basically states that the pressure of a gas is inversely proportional to the volume that contains it. So here's two containers with a certain amount of gas in it. You've got a certain number of molecules in that gas, okay? relative to the same number. You don't have any more gas molecules, but you have a bigger container. So this one would be high volume, yes? This is low volume. Which one is the high pressure? High pressure would be where? This, the little one or the big one? So if you have a small volume containing a gas, it's gonna be high pressure. If I just expand that volume, that container, that pressure goes down. So Boyle's law states that volume and pressure are inversely proportional to each other. If you wanna write it mathematically, then you could say that the pressure of a gas is inversely proportional to its volume. As one goes up, the other goes down. Okay, let's take a look at another one. The other one we're gonna be taking a look at is what's called Dalton's Law. This is basically states that the total pressure of a mixed gas is equal to the sum of the partial pressures of each component gas. So let's take a look now and take a look at the pressure of the atmosphere. What gases are in the atmosphere? 
What are you breathing right now? Oxygen is in there, right? Nitrogen is in there. Hydrogen, not so much, because you would feel that, that would hurt. Uh, not carbon, but you're close, you can add to it. Carbon dioxide, yep. Anything else? So either stuff, pollutants, right? So if you're on I-25, there's probably gonna be carbon monoxide. Thank you, car exhaust. Water vapor, right? So all of those partial pressures, each one of those has a specific pressure to them, added together gives you the pressure of the mixed gas. That's Dalton's law. Why is that important? Because what we breathe is a mixed gas. We don't breathe oxygen, we breathe a mixed gas. Actually, most of the gas that we breathe is mostly nitrogen, okay? It's not mostly oxygen. So that's Dalton's law. The other one is Henry's law. This basically says that the solubility of a gas in liquid is dependent on temperature and pressure. So this one is best illustrated by a two liter bottle of Coke. Think about it. Is there pressure in that two liter bottle of Coke? How do you know? Because all you have to do is pop the top, right? And pressure comes out. Okay, think about it. Now, wait, 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 wait. What's coming out? Like when you pop the top of a two liter bottle, what's happening? Bubbles, right? Where were those bubbles? Can you see bubbles in it when you have a closed bottle? When the bottle's tight and sealed and you're shopping for it and you pick it up, do you see a bunch of bubbles in there? I don't, it may have been a while since we picked up a two liter bottle, right? But are there bubbles in there? Well, you can't see them, right? So then when you, that basically means that that bottle is under pressure. What's it, what are the bubbles made out of? What are, what's in the bubble? Carbon dioxide, right? So we can actually sort of spruce this conversation up a little bit and say, is there carbon dioxide in that two liter bottle of Coke? How do you know? You can't see it. It just looks like a brown liquid when you have the bottle, yes? So where's the carbon dioxide? Huh? It's in the mixture. And how did you get it in the mixture? By pressurizing it. So the reason why, and a lot of people miss this, the reason why a two liter bottle is under pressure and any kind of a drink is under pressure that's carbonated, cans as well, is because the CO2 that's in them will only dissolve in the liquid under high pressure. So what that means is the solubility goes up as pressure of the gas or pressure goes up. So greater solubility under greater pressure. Now then, once we pop the top, what happens to the pressure of the bottle? It goes down and then it, the, the CO2 is no longer soluble at that lower pressure point. So it comes out of solution. And when it does so, a gas coming out of solution in a liquid form bubbles. And you basically have the bubbles of carbon dioxide coming out. Now, what happens if we take that two liter bottle of Coke and it's just open and we leave it on a day like this out there on the sidewalk on a nice hot day, according to the weather report, it'd be getting close to the century mark today. Let's leave it out there for a few hours. What is it gonna taste like afterwards? Yeah, it goes flat. So what does that mean that it goes flat? Yeah, all the CO2 is gone. Is it gone because of pressure? No, it's gone because of what? 
temperature. So your solubility decreases with increasing temperature. That's the reason why it goes flat. So temperature and pressure affects solubility. And this affects how the gases that we're breathing are affected in our body, right? So we have this basic sort of system now. Hang on to these laws. We're going to see how, especially with Boyle's Law and Dalton's Law, we're going to see how these guys interplay with uh, respiratory physics. Now, the other law is not... It's, it's not a respiratory, it's not a gas law, it's, it's a diffusion law, it's called Fick's law. And what Fick's law basically does, it takes all the parameters of diffusion and puts them kind of in an equation. And that is to say that diffusion is directly proportional to the surface area that you're diffusing across. More surface area, the more diffusion you get. It's also directly proportional to the solubility of the gas, hello, Henry's law, right? The more soluble you are, the more diffusional you are. And it's also directly proportional to the partial pressure of the gas itself. Hello, Dalton's law. So if you have a high partial pressure and high solubility, then you have high diffusion. So these are all things that will increase diffusion and it's inversely proportional to the distance that it has to cross. Like for instance, the membrane that it has to cross over, which is the reason why your respiratory membrane is so tiny, is to eliminate that denominator so that you can get massive, uh, massive diffusional rates. And that's basically what we're talking about. So um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the structure of the cavity itself. So our blood supply, this is a review of 21, to be quite honest with you, right? So we have our pulmonary circuit of our arteries heading to our lungs, um, where they will basically break out in that capillary network that we just saw, and it'll basically cross the respiratory membrane, and then it'll be picked up by the, um, the arterial side um, by the pulmonary venules and the veins, and then it'll go to the left atrium. Um, this is also, by the way, where the angiotensin converting enzyme, because remember we said that um, angiotensin one will circulate through the body up into the lungs where it'll be converted to angiotensin two. So the site of angiotensin two creation is in the lungs because angiotensin converting enzyme ACE is the one that does that. Well, this is the location of that enzyme. So your angiotensin two gets created in the lungs and then distributed to the rest of the body. The blood pressure then in your pulmonary circuit is a lot lower than your systemic. It's only 30 millimeters of mercury. Remember what the systemic one was? Systemic was 100. So that just basically tells you that it's a lower pressure point because you're just going next door to each of the pleural cavities. And so you don't need a ton of that, right? So generally speaking, when you're taking a look at these pulmonary pressures, it's low pressure anyway. You're getting broken up on all these tiny little um, capillaries, which makes you very susceptible to blockages, right? So clots, fat, air bubbles. This is the reason why you don't want to just inject a big old air bubble into you because you're basically going to kill yourself because um, it'll block your blood vessels ultimately. Uh, but these blockages will cause pulmonary embolism, which is essentially a blockage in a vessel, um, typically in your lungs themselves. Now let's take a look at the cavities. So the cavities essentially are a division of the mediastinum. So we saw already the thoracic cavity. I drew that already in a previous chapter where your mediastinum is kind of like right here in the middle and your pleural cavities are on either side and your lungs basically inhabit the two pleural cavities. And now we wanna talk a little bit about the structure of that pleural cavities a little bit because it's going to be, it's going to be important in terms of um, kind of taking a look at the inhalation, the exhalation cycle. Okay, so we wanna understand the basic working parts of it. And so inside each of the pleural cavities, you're gonna see a lung, 
Um, and of course, it's covered by the serous membrane system, the pleura, where you have both visceral and parietal pleura. It's like we have before, you need kind of a serous membrane system. You have your parietal pleura, which basically covers the pleural cavity. And the visceral pleura, which basically covers the lung tissue itself. And then in the um, space, you have the pleural fluid, which lubricates the layers and keeps the tissue, the, the, um, the cavity itself. So you have kind of this, this um, situation where you have this fluid space. But here's the thing. When you're talking about your lungs, you're talking about an oscillation of pressures, right? Because what you're breathing in is air pressure. What you're breathing out is air pressure. In your, your pleural cavity, you've got fluid in that pleural cavity, which exerts a fluid pressure. So there's a lot of pressure going on um, everywhere. And so we want to take a look at those pressures and that affects a lot of what's happening here. So for instance, when you take a look at these pressures and what your lungs are doing, you have two different types of respiration, external respiration, which is the one we're going to be talking about. That's basically bringing in oxygen and CO2 into your bloodstream and internal respiration. This is cellular respiration. This is the role of mitochondria. This is what you learned in general bio. Okay. If you took general bio, All right? But that's basically making ATP. That's what internal cellular respiration is. Uh, but what we're going to be talking about is external cellular respiration. So we're or external respiration. So we're not going to be really talking about that um, internal uh, component of it. So let's take a look at the pieces of the external respiration. That's basically what we do, breathe, right? The breathing mechanism. So first of all, you've got pulmonary ventilation, which is breathing. We're going to take a look at that here in just a second. So the first thing you have to do is breathe, right? That's inhalation and exhalation um, or inspiration, expiration. And then what you breathe, you have to do gas exchange, right? So this is going across those respiratory membranes and those capillaries. So that's another piece. And then you have to transport. That means the blood has got to get, um, got to, get to the heart in order to be able to um, take all of this to the tissues. And basically it's just a kind of a big circular, okay? And so you have to have those three components for your, for your external respiration. This kind of what it looks like in pictures. You can see you have, you have your breathing, your gas diffusion into the blood, which transports it to the tissues, who uses it, you pick up the trash, and then you basically go back into the blood and then back to the lungs where you exhale it and send back and forth and back and forth. Okay, so it's a big cycle um, that typically um, doesn't stop unless you hold your breath. Okay, so what are some aberrations of this? Well, hypoxia, which is low oxygen levels and anoxia, which is no oxygen. Um, generally speaking, most of what we see is hypoxia or severe hypoxia. It's very rare to see absolute anoxia because in the absence of oxygen, the ultimate absence of oxygen, you basically, the cells are gonna die. So that is like a no way, that's like a, that's like a, you know, there's no way to get out of that one. Um, so what we typically see like cyanotic individuals, if they're turning blue, they're not anoxic typically, they're, they're severely hypoxic is usually what they are. So there is some oxygen there, it's just not enough to support your needs. And so it's all about relative amounts. So let's take a look, first of all, at pulm pulmonary ventilation, right? That's the first piece of this. And we're gonna talk about gas exchange and then we'll talk um, a little bit about those three pieces. Um, and so the first one is pulmonary ventilation. So when we take a look at pulmonary ventilation, that is the basically say moving of air into your respiratory tract or into your lungs itself. What we're really interested in is not just pulmonary ventilation, but the alveolar ventilation. This is the air that gets into the alveoli. Why? Why just the alveoli? Because the alveoli, this is where the respiratory membrane is. So this is the only place in your respiratory system where you have that physiological activity. 
which is the exchange piece. So you want to have all your air in the alveoli. In, in, in the alveoli is going to have contact or uh, they'll have contact with that respiratory membrane. So you want your air to have contact with the respiratory membrane. Air in contact with any other tissue is useless. The air that is in your bronchial, useless. The air that's still in your, your um, trachea, useless. It has to be in contact with the respiratory membrane in order to exchange. That's the only place. That's the reason why we're not interested necessarily in just pulmonary ventilation. We're interested in the alveolar ventilation. That is to say, what air is in direct contact with that respiratory membrane? Now, what air are we talking about? The air that we're talking about moving is indeed atmospheric pressure, right? And atmospheric pressure is the, if you to define atmospheric pressure, is basically the weight of the atmosphere in a column. So like, for instance, if you're standing right here, the weight of the entire atmosphere pushing down gas-wise is exactly one atmosphere. Okay, that's what we define an atmosphere as. We typically use atmospheres, which is also equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, which is also equal to 760 torr. Those are three different pressure measurements that we oftentimes will run into, and we use them interchangeably. Most clinical settings, you're probably running into millimeter of mercury, which is 760. And the reason why this is important is because this is the pressure of where we are. This is the pressure of the air that's all around us. Now, when you're looking then at inhalation, that is to say moving this atmospheric pressure, that gets us to our Boyle's Law. Remember that pressure and, and, vo and, and uh, volume are inversely proportional. So how do we use this then to our advantage? So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at our respiratory cycle. We're gonna take a look at inspiration and an expiration. So the inhalation, the inhale, exhale. We're gonna take a look at both of those. Now, what do we do? What we do, the way that we inhale is by manipulating pressures. That's what we do. So how do we do that? Easy, we make use of Boyle's Law. Pressure we cannot change because it is what it is. The atmospheric pressure around us is what it is. We can't change that. However, what we can do is we can change the volume quite easily, and that's exactly what we do. So when we go through volume changes, we create, by physics, by Boyle's Law, pressure changes. And what do we do? We change the volume of the thoracic cavity. So let's take a look at this here just a second. So here's how we inhale. So here's our lung in our pleural cavity. And so here's our diaphragm that's connected to the parietal um, layer of the cavity. At this particular point, the pressure outside is equal to the pressure inside. What that means is the inside pressure of the alveolus is equal to the pressure of the atmosphere. And that's actually how I prefer to write it. Alveolus is equal to atmosphere. Now, Let's go ahead and try to take a breath, shall we? Remember, you can't change pressure. The atmospheric pressure is 760, doesn't matter. You can't change that, okay? So how do you get that air into you? Well, remember, we do what we always said before, gradients. Produce a gradient and you'll get things to move. So what do we do first? What we do is we contract our diaphragm and all of our other respiratory muscles. That's gonna pull down on the lower end of the cavity and that lower end of the cavity is going to increase the volume. What is it gonna be doing to the pressure inside there if I increase the volume? If I increase the volume, the pressure goes down, right? By Boyle's law. But guess what? Did the outside pressure of the atmosphere change at all? No, it doesn't change. It is what it is, right? So at this particular point now, what I've just done is because of Boyle's law, now the atmospheric pressure 
is greater than my alveolar pressure? Well, according to pressure gradients, which direction is air gonna flow? It's gonna flow from high, which is on the outside here, to low, which is on the inside. So all you have to do is what? Open your mouth and the air will flow in, down its pressure gradient, automatically. And then what'll happen is there'll be a point there where you stop and now you've got these inflated lungs and you kind of stop there. And you come to this place where it kind of comes to rest. So the alveoli and the atmosphere sort of recalibrate, right? They kind of become the same again. And then what you do is you relax your diaphragm and the diaphragm will push back up, decreasing the volume, which is gonna do what to the, vol to the pressure inside? So the volume goes down, the pressure goes up. So now did the atmospheric pressure change at all? So now what you have is the atmosphere is lower than the alveoli. So which direction does air go? Down the pressure gradient, which is now pointing the other direction. So out it goes. And that's your exhale. So notice what you did. The way you breathe is by manipulating Boyle's law. The other thing is also, and this kind of sounds like a little, it's a little violating a bit, right? But notice a lot of times we think of breathing as like us hunting the air down. Like we've got to go and hunt it down. We like, you know, suck it in. Like, like we're kind of, that's not how it works. What happens is it's kind of more like the atmosphere forcing its way down our throat. So the second that we open up our lungs, it's like the atmosphere just like, just comes right down our throat. Like it's being forced down our throat. All of a sudden now breathing doesn't seem so pleasant, but necessary. Okay. So that's basically how Boyle's law factors into um, <coughs> how it actually sets up that inspiration exhalation piece of it. The other thing also to notice is that inspiration is active. You contract your diaphragm. generally speaking. So ultimately, you contract your diaphragm to inhale and you just let go. Let your exhale. Contract to inhale, just let go. Let your exhale. Okay. So that kind of gets us to a lot of things that affect pulmonary ventilation. Um, for instance, compliance, right? This is basically your expandability. So if you have low compliance, for instance, you have low expandability, it requires greater force to get the same expansion as before. If you have high compliance, it requires less force of breathing. Generally speaking, you will get what you want, need to get one way or the other. It's just a matter of how much you have to work for it, right? So if you have to really apply force to get what you normally would get, that would be referred to as a kind of a low compliance situation. Some of the things that affect compliance is obviously the connective tissue that kind of forces that sort of outer limit. Um, surfactant production, like if you don't have enough surfactant, your alveoli are gonna stick together a little bit, causing you to have to inhale harder to get those alveoli to pop open. Um, so if you have a low production of surfactant, that'll happen. And then of course, if you have thoracic cage mobility issues, anybody who's had broken ribs knows what I'm talking about there. Right, so you have kind of a, a fundamental inability to kind of expand your chest because your ribs are broken. That's thoracic mobility issues, right? That's gonna, that's gonna reduce your compliance. 
So um, we talked a little bit already about um, one atmosphere is basically one, uh, one atmosphere or 760 torr. Now the interpulmonary pressure, this is kind of like a, a couple of things I need to talk about here. Uh, first of all, the atmospheric pressure is always the same. So it's gonna be one atmosphere or 760 millimeters or torr, it doesn't really matter, each one, you, either one you want. Then we wanna take a look at what's called the intrapulmonary pressure. So this is called intra or inside the alveoli pressure. Um, and so this is always relative and you're always comparing it to your atmospheric. Generally speaking, whenever you're just doing relaxed breathing, the oscillation difference in pressure is only plus or minus a millimeter of mercury. So you're not talking about dramatic changes in pressure. You're just talking about a millimeter of mercury up or down. And that's good enough to get you just a normal restful breathing. Okay, what we call tidal volume. Now, you, you already know that even though you're resting normally, right, you have a lot more capacity to breathe, don't you? Like as you're sitting here just restfully, you're going oscillating in and out. One, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. If I told you to take a deep breath, you've got a lot more lung capacity to take a deep breath, don't you? If I told you to breathe out as far as you can, you've got a lot more room to breathe out, don't you? So where we are at rest, is only a small spectrum of what our total lung abilities are. And so that lung ability will oscillate between minus 30 on the exhale side and plus 100 on the inhale side. Generally speaking, it's much more physiologically, um, I should say safe, less wear and tear basically on structure and, and tissues and things like that to stay within that plus minus one range. But in cases where you need to breathe heavier or you need to bring in more oxygen, you have the ceiling, the headroom to get there. And you have the bottom or the floor space to get there in case you have to really do strong, deep breaths, right? But remember, those are designed for situations. Those are more episodic. Like that's not your everyday. So just do a nice passive back and forth. That's what we call it tidal volume. It's just like the ebb and flow. Just like a tide comes and goes, comes and goes. And then if you need to, you can really tap into it way up and you can tap into it way bottom. So you can really expand the depth and the, and the height of your breath if you have to, but you only do that under certain certain areas, like running from the lion, for instance, right? Uh, things of that nature. Normally, if you've done this, this is called straining. Um, this would be a really bad kind of a wear and tear situation. So the intrapleural pressure, this is the pressure in the space between the parietal and the visceral. And this is important, right? Because there's fluid in there, but it also has pressure. And as you change the pressures of your lung tissue, it's also gonna change the pressure of that space. So when you take a look at the intrapleural pressure, it's basically oscillating between minus four and minus 18, but it always remains below atmospheric throughout the entire cycle. And so what you end up getting is actually, when you see the diaphragm pull, it's pulling on the pleural cavity, but it doesn't actually pull on the lung tissue itself. What it does is it pulls in the pleural cavity and that pleural cavity, as it expands outward, causes changes in the volume of the pleural space. That pleural cavity will change its volume and that'll change the pressure, which will then suck, if you will, the lungs itself. And that's kind of what causes the lungs to open. So when you take a look at the mechanism of how the diaphragm works, so if this is my parietal layer, this is my visceral layer, this is my lung right here, this is my pleural cavity, that has pressure in it. The diaphragm will pull the cavity itself open like that. It'll pull the cavity wall like that. It'll pull the cavity wall. That changes the pressure in here, which sort of sucks the lung open. So you never actually touch the lung and grab and pull it. You're sort of sucking it open. It's kind of like, Kind of like you're just sort of creating a little bit of a pressure so it kind of pulls that lung open just enough to get you to that point. So when you're taking a look at your respiratory cycle, you're talking about this oscillation between inspiration and expiration. Um, and it's this respiratory pump, this inspiration oscillation that creates this respiratory pump that we talked about in the last chapter, how you get venous blood return to the heart itself. And all that, but this plus or minus oscillation back and forth is something we call tidal volume, which is actually 
a, spir a spirometry measure that we oftentimes will use to measure how we're breathing. So if you go into spirometry or pulmonologist, they'll do these different tests on you. One of the things they find out is what your tidal volume is. Where your tidal volume is, that's just the amount of air that's going in and out at rest. So this is just your tidal inflow, outflow, inflow, outflow. This is kind of what it looks like. You're just breathing in nice and gentle like. This is a nice tidal flow in and out. <clears throat> so this is kind of illustrating the pressure differences. So you can see the diaphragm is pulling on the cavity wall and this pleural cavity will change pressure, which will pull on the lungs itself. So here you can see, you can see the um, pleural cavity pressure here in blue and the alveolar pressure here in red. And so you can see how one sort of responds to the other. So you get a change in the um, cavity pressure, which will then change the alveolar pressure. And that gets you to your volume. So your contraction of your diaphragm or your inhale is always the inflection in tidal volume. The deflection going back down is the exhale. So this is inhale, this is your exhale. That's basically what that is. So we already talked about that, it's passive. Uh, some of the muscles, I just wanna sort of um, leave with this one because I wanna to get to um, dead anatomic space. But the muscles that are involved in here, most of your muscle work is the diaphragm. Right, so that's basically the majority of it. Um, and that gets most of your airflow. However, your external intercostals, this is for rib cage expansion. To kind of expand or accommodate these sort of expanding balloons in your chest. Um, so that gets the others. And there are also accessories like for instance, sternocleidomastoid, which is the big rope that's basically pulling the rib cage up as your lungs expand. Uh, your serratus anterior, right, which is kind of like that little feather underneath here, that's kind of pulling your rib cage open so that it expands this direction. Your pectoralis minor, which is underneath, is pulling upward and kind of expanding the chest outward like that. So uh, same thing with the scalenes. There's scalenes in various places where you basically have them pulling up or pulling out on the chest cavity. And so all those are accessories. If you have, a da if you have damage to any one of those, you're going to probably have a problem. So we're gonna be moving into spirometry um, and we're gonna be looking at respiratory rates and volumes, right? So basically a rate is breaths per minute, whereas volume, uh, tidal volume is the amount of air per breath, right? So we have this idea of breathing rates or respiratory rates versus respiratory volumes. Um, and we're gonna be taking a look more at not just tidal volume, but other types of volumes. So we've already been introduced to tidal volume. That's just a normal in and out at rest. Respiratory minute volume is the amount of air that you, uh, the volume of air that you breathe per minute, right? So that's just basically a respiratory rate times tidal volume. That's basically what it is. So the rate, remember, is breath per minute. Tidal volume is the volume per breath. So breaths cancel out. This gives you volume per minute. So this is your RMV, respiratory minute volume, okay. And this is a measure of your pulmonary ventilation. So what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about alveolar ventilation and some dead space. We kind of talked about this a little bit already. Um, and then we will do that on Wednesday. And then uh, at Wednesday, I will give you guys the plan of what the next two lecture days are. Because after Wednesday, we'll have two more lecture days. And we have digestive and urinary. What I would like to do is try to get this one in mostly a complete state by the end of Wednesday so that I could have a full two hours set for digestive, a full two hours set for urinary. That's the plan. But for lab, we have reproductive system. So I hopefully have a 